equity on their steering committee. Um, as a conference and general assembly coordinator, uh, we've been trying to prep uh, our members and, and other, P, other white allies within the denomination a little bit for general assembly and things like that. Uh, I see that we seem to have kind of mostly new faces and a little bit of a smaller group than we had last week. So we're gonna do probably a little bit of a recap of the information that we covered last week, but then we wanna move it forward into a little bit deeper conversation. Um, so I will let Donna introduce herself. Um, we are co-facilitating today, and we are hoping, um, like we usually said, we're hoping for a much more conversational format uh, than is the norm, which might be a little bit of a challenge in this um, on this platform, but uh, seems to have been working out okay. So, uh, so that's we're not looking to be talky, 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 talky at you. We're hoping to hear a lot from um, from all of you, and we'll have some questions around um, white resistance. So, I will turn it over to Donna Renfro, who is my co-facilitator. Hi, everyone. Donna Renfro. I'm the interim minister and. In, um, Northwoods UU Church, just outside Houston, Texas. Uh, been on Allies for Racial Equity, I think, four years now. Um, and we are really glad to be able to try this format to talk to people. We found that uh, we had a practice of having an annual conference but not that many people could come to it. And so we decided to have these teleconferences and uh, webinars. And I will tell you the way that we're doing this is very different than the ones that I mostly take um, in the UU world. Uh, there are no PowerPoint presentations, so don't be looking for that. Um, no pictures either. Uh, we really want to have a conversation. And last week, uh, I got to do something new that um, Lori uh, is with CLF. Lori, you probably want to talk about yourself a little bit. But we did some. We um, we went into breakout rooms, and so instead of the whole group staying together, we um, we went down to three, four, or five of us. Um, and so we might try that tonight if um, you guys are open to that, because we really don't want to be talking heads. We want to be in conversation with you. And as Carolina said, um, boy, this year feels like we have the biggest role that we have had coming into um, GA to really help white allies um, understand the work better and and be in relationship not only with drum uh the diverse revolutionary unitarian universalist multicultural ministries um which is kind of our co or maybe parent organization we are in uh, relation to them but we are also supporting the black lives of UU and um, people of color who have not affiliated as well so um, learning how to be allies and accomplices together Laura you want to talk a little bit Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lori Stone Sartoski, and I am with the Church of the Larger Fellowship. And I'm here tonight to do a little bit of facilitation of the process around the tech, but also I am on the uh, steering committee for Allies for Racial Equity. So I look forward to sharing some of my stories with you all if uh, if we do get into the breakout. So that's it. Okay, so I see that we have kind of a very, very manageable group. That's exciting. Um, and it looks like we have a little bit of a different group than we had last week. So uh, we'd like to start off um, finding out um, a little bit about what 
uh, drew you in, and maybe if Lori can kind of call on people, um, uh, what kind of drew you into this webinar, and how are you seeing white resistance, or how are you feeling white resistance within, you know, specifically a UU context? And maybe, did you have any questions or any things that you might want to talk about in our time together this evening? So that's kind of the question. We'd be really interested, you know, I see um, in relationship to the material that we're using as kind of a, as a base, like as a foundation, um, I see a lot of things in our sphere with Allies for Racial Equity. I see a lot of people who are presenting a certain way who seem to be at a, a certain stage of development, but I know that I don't, see what other people are seeing in their congregation, which varies by location and varies by um, how engaged the congregation might be in justice issues. So if we could just hear a little bit um, from everyone who's on the phone tonight about what are you kind of looking for? What are you seeing? Um, and what would you like to talk about? Uh, and you don't have to answer all three, just, um, just kind of clue us in so we can do better. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just go across my screen. Mary, Brian, or Byron, I'm going to, uh, why don't you give it, go ahead and kick us off. Hi, um, so I, I belong to the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood, New Jersey, which is in northern New Jersey, just outside of, uh, just outside of New York City. And I'm part of the racial justice committee that we have. And uh, we do a lot of education within our congregation. And um, in April, we hung our Black Lives Matter banner on the, on the, uh, on the building. Um, and in the process of doing that and the education and um, events we've been doing, the resistance that we get most is all lives matter. And really wanting to put it in that context and, and talk about it in that context. So as a group, um, our racial justice committee is, you know, continuing to look at um, the kinds of things that we can do within our congregation to um, continue to work on um, the awareness, um, I would say, first and foremost, and, and education. So um, I said I would join the um, Allies for Racial Equity to get a sense of, are there resources here and how could we think about leveraging those um, into, uh, into our community. So that's why I'm here. And I watched the previous ones on, uh, on YouTube, so it's great that you record them and put them up there as resources. Great, Andrew, thanks, Mary. I, oh, sorry, I have a quick question, Mary. Sure. About how long did it take you from deciding that you wanted to, t to put up a Black Lives Matter banner to the time that you, were, you actually did it? I'm just curious how long the process took within your congregation. Um, it was about eight months. And, uh, and so, because we decided in the fall that we wanted to set it up for a spring vote. And that we, you know, we knew we had education work to do, um, you know, within the congregation, but it was about eight months. Great, thanks, Mary. So Wayne Moyer, uh, would you like to go ahead and go next? Yes, can you hear me? We sure can. Am I on? Okay. Uh, this is, I'm at the Williamsburg Unitarian Universalist in Virginia, and uh, we put up a banner about, um, well, uh, a month ago, but we had no trouble with the board on the issue. Uh, we have, I think, a very involved congregation. In fact, we did a survey based on the continuum on becoming an anti-racist, multicultural congregation that is in the Jubilee Anti-Racism Training Manual. Uh, we on the uh, Mosaic Makers Committee felt we were probably about a three, but we were surprised to find that most of the congregation in our survey feels we were a number four anti-racist or even five and fully inclusive. Well, we, we do feel we have much work to do, and we have run uh, workshops on various books, such as uh, the uh, current reading, uh, Just Mercy, and others. We also did workshops with other groups in the town on um, the new Jim Crow. So I think we have 
an engaged congregation, but I can't say for sure everybody's on the same plate. Great, thanks Wayne. Uh, we'll move to Leslie Rennells next. Hi, um, we put up our uh, banner kind of out of the blue. There was no discussion about it. One day I went to church and I was like, whoa, there's a Black Lives Matter banner. So I asked like, what was the decision? How did it get up there? Because I do a lot of anti-racism work and um, I was just kind of confused how it happened. And what we were going to do if it got defaced or if we got backlash, did we have a plan? Um, and so out of that, it kind of came up that a white person had bought it and put it up, um, which is part of what we're working on, right? So out of that, um, a very energetic person, woman of color in our group, Jolanda Walters, who's going to be the GA coordinator for um, 2017 when it comes to New Orleans, um, wanted to start this group in the morning called Uncomfortable Conversations. Um, and Reverend Paul Beadle asked her to, to get a co-facilitator. So she and I um, lead this discussion every Sunday morning before church. We get somewhere between three to ten people. Um, our church is about 80 people. So, you know, that's not a large percentage of the uh, church attending. Um, and we have I, what I call issue syndrome. Um, we've got a food ministries group. We've got an anti-racism you know, meeting in the morning. We've got um, reproductive justice. Uh, uh, just some others. So we're kind of all spread out. We're not very organized. Uh, we're not very intersectional. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Well, thank you, Leslie. All right, Cynthia, you're next. Uh, I unmuted you, Cynthia. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. That's okay. <laughs> oh, so I am uh, fairly new as the part-time minister in uh, New Bern, uh, North Carolina. Um, but I j drop in <laughs> for eight days a month while I live in Virginia. Um, and I'm still getting used to the community. It seems like it's very segregated. The um, UU Fellowship is mostly older white Yankees who retired there. <laughs> and we have very few locals, uh, very few African Americans. So just, um, I'm trying to find my place and see where the work of uh, the uh, anti-racism is in this in this, in this new community. <laughs> Great, thanks, Cynthia. Amaris, would you want to go next? Sure, thanks. Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm my name is Emrys Staten. I'm a intern minister. I'm doing my internship at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Phoenix. Um, I'm. Originally was just going to be here for the 10 months of the internship and I was helping get a little bit of racial justice stuff going We did a we had a film screening of slavery by another name, which was really well attended and had a great discussion after that I've had a small group uh, meeting to think of some more stuff to do but um, Didn't didn't have a, a real long-term vision because the internships, you, you know, they end and then um, we've got a uh, situation where I'm going to be able to stay out of the congregation for another year or so. Uh, so I'm trying to put a lot more effort into a racial justice kind of group or and, and more activities here at the congregation. Um, so we have a banner up uh, over our parking lot, but it's not really visible from the street. And so we're trying to think of some things around how to broadcast that more. Um, and also I've been trying to really build a good relationship with one of the um, ministers that works in downtown Phoenix and has been kind of a, a core Black Lives Matter person in Phoenix, especially around issues with the Phoenix Police Department. So my hope is actually to really work with him more and see what we can do around changing police policies and procedures in, in Phoenix. I think that's ultimately what I'd like to see our energies go towards, along with education and reflection with the population. <laughs> so that's some of the stuff that we're working on. Great, thank you. Bryant, you're next. 
Hi there, I'm Bryant Brown from the church in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and I did my internship at the Annapolis Church, which was just at, then at the end of a 10-year process of anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism. And so I want to find out what conversations are going on now in our denomination and what actions are being taken and what people's experiences are as I try to build a fire under my congregation to get involved in this process. Great, thank you. Michael, on the phone? Walter, I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Long Beach. And unlike almost everyone else in the call, I'm not a minister. Um, we have a racial justice task force, which was started by our minister in the fall. And our congregation, we have a, we have a banner that's going to be going up soon, but we wanted that not to be the focus of our efforts. What we did was we just had a resolution that we brought before the entire congregation to support Black Lives Matter. And the, it, it was implied in that, that we would be putting up a banner, but that was not what the vote was about. It was to support Black Lives Matter and that the, our uh, racial justice strategic planning committee would make the decision about you know, put down when the banner would go up and the nature of the banner. And we'll be putting it up in a very prominent location in August. We're gonna have it be a community event. So we're inviting faith leaders, and civic leaders and uh, people from the nearby neighborhood to be a part of that. And we want it to be more than just you know, the, the ban raising the banner is just a symbol that that's not, that isn't what we, you know, what we want to say that we've done is put up a banner. What we want to say is we're engaging and making the lives of black people. Um, we're working to make the lives of black people better. Um, then we want to have these various community leaders sort of make a commitment as to what they're going to do to improve the, uh, the quality of black people's lives um, in Long Beach and, in, uh, and beyond. All right. And on something that, uh, wait, I, just, I just wanted to also, I don't know if I said it, yeah, it, it, the timeline was it started in the fall and we, so we've been working on it all along and we have a lot of other activities going on as well in addition to raising the banner. So that would be it. All right, thank you, Michael. Joan, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'm a member of a congregation in Worcester, Massachusetts that is overwhelmingly white. We have been very lucky in having a ministerial intern who was particularly interested in, in racial justice. And so there was activity uh, that she was responsible for for starting um, discussion of of uh, the new Jim Crow uh, showing of the series that NPR put on, but nothing really has caught hold for the congregation as a whole. Um, I am personally involved in in racial justice things because there is another Unitarian church downtown around the outskirts, and they have had a series um, looking at racism through movies and, and books, and that's still going on. And um, I hope, I think that it's on the verge of looking at what can be done. Um, and that is being presided over by the, the downtown church, which does have a banner. Uh, I don't know what else they're doing. There is also a group that is reading um, a book called Witnessing Whiteness, going chapter by chapter, a chapter a month that was a spinoff from a series of discussions that the city sponsored this past summer. And the author of that book has a new book coming out on racism and spirituality. And um, with the blessings of my minister, 
we are going to be sponsoring or co-sponsoring a book signing for her sometime in June. Um, it's the church is a regional rather than um, a local church. So it's very difficult to get people going on anything. One of the, the problems that I see is that when people um, get engaged with topics, they tend to be identified with those topics and then anything that has to do with that topic is sort of considered their thing and nobody else gets involved. So I'm interested in hearing about what other places are doing and how um, we might get motivated to, to do more. All right, thanks, Joan. So we have one more person, and I didn't get your name, I'm sorry, but your phone number ends in 6682. Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Ben Davis. Oh, I'm sorry, can you go I, ahead and start? We just unmuted you. Thank you, yes. Uh, uh, my name is Leanne Friedman. I'm in uh, at the UU Church of Davis, Davis, California. And we are very excited because we've been working on getting the banner thing going. Uh, it started with uh, one of our uh, members. I'm a member of the our uh, local church uh, racial justice committee. And one of our members, Jen Higley Chapman, went to GA and came back full of fire about putting up a banner. And so we've gone through the whole process of going to the board, getting their authorization to call a uh, congregational meeting, you know, we went through all the hoops, jumped through all the hoops, but we are having our banner installation and dedication this Sunday. So, uh, and we've invited um, the neighborhood, we've invited uh, the local police department, I, I know our local chief and he's a real good guy, and we're inviting everybody. So we'll see what happens, but it's it's going up this Sunday. So that's we're really excited. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and that's everybody. I'll go ahead and turn it back over to facilitators. So, um, the, you know what? This was really, really great to hear. And I kind of a little bit regret not having it done that last time around. Um, because it sounds like we have a, a crew today that is really really involved um whether or not that's kind of have been involved for a long time um or that is about to hang their banner this weekend i think that's really really awesome um so i think because it is relatively new i think what might be good to do um is just do a little bit of a recap of these phases um the, these stages of development for white folks and if you have had a chance to review the material, um, it, is, it is different for people of color and we need to be mindful of that when we start kind of having an analysis and, and looking at people and saying, oh, I think they're in this stage or looking at organizations and thinking they're in this stage. We need to recognize that, that the stages of development are very, very different for people of privilege than they are for people on the margins. So, we're going to just review. I think we are going to read these out loud, and then we're, Donna and I are going to have a little bit of a conversation. She was our she was our process observer last week, so she gets to talk this week, um, and just have some reflection around these. Maybe tell a story or two, and then we'd like to revisit them. And um, or if something pops into your head. Um, to talk about that particular stage of development. We would love to hear from you uh, because again, it's, you know, some people have been, been in this a very long time and they have developed strategies and we love it. You know, if they're, if the strategies are in this room, we would love to hear them. Um, and then maybe we can talk about some strategies and we'll see how we do on time. Um, but we are, we are about a third way in right now. So, um, I will start, I think what we'll do is, Donna, I will kind of start and read the thing and then maybe you will have some opinion about that, right? So, um, 
So the first stage, um, if you have not reviewed this, is called contact. And that stage is marked by a lack of awareness of cultural and institutional racism and of one's own white privilege. This stage often includes naive curiosity about or fear of people of color based on stereotypes learned from friends, family, and the media. Those whose lives are structured so as to limit their interactions with people of color, as well as their awareness of racial issues. Some people may, may, may remain in this stage indefinitely. So Donna, tell us what you have seen about that. Well, um, here I am in Texas, and um, I see uh, a lot of that here, but I can't tell you that I didn't also see it in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hi, Brian. Um, also, um, you know, what jumps out for me when we read that one is the people who say, well, I'm not prejudiced. You know, it, it's like they they still very much think of themselves that they claim not to be. And of course, the other side of that, as it says in here, is that there is fear. And sometimes people will acknowledge that fear and sometimes they don't. And sometimes it comes, you know, just to be real about it. Um, you know, even those of us who have been doing the work for a long time can find us ourselves in places where fear can come again. Um, so I, I, I want to believe that not a whole lot of people in our congregations are at this stage. I think they probably have family and friends and possibly business associates who might be. Um, but I think especially after listening to all of y'all, I'm just so awed by all that you're doing. I, I think that we've raised enough awareness in our congregations that, um, that, um, we're moving away from the stereotypes anyway. Now, the last part of that, that there's a limit to the people of color. I, I think what comes up for me and that is the wonderful shift I've seen in our congregations away from, oh, let's just get more people of color in here. You know, let, let's get um, non-white faces. I think that we've, that we're moving beyond that. Um, at least that's my hope. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you. And one of the things that just struck me when I was, when I was reviewing it this time around is, I wonder if it's kind of here where some, um, cultural misappropriation happens where we kind of are not aware but we think something is cool and then we take it from that culture and it seems to me that over the last few years I've heard so much conversation about that kind of misappropriation that it feels as if we've kind of moved beyond that um, doesn't mean that we're not appropriative sometimes in other ways but um, but I wonder if this is where kind of like fetishizing happens and exotification happens because of the lack of awareness. Um, so does anybody have anything to say about, does any of this resonate with you that, um, are, are you encountering people in this stage? Um, kind of by surprise this it generally happens to me by surprise from time to time I'll be in a UU sphere and I won't have this expectation and then all of a sudden someone will say things and I think somebody had said and I don't I can't remember who exactly had said it but um oh it was the first one 
Um, it was Mary Byron who said that some of their conversation in their in, in her sphere is the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter conversation. So um, I'm just wondering, has anybody have any memory of when they felt like they were more dealing with people in the stage and what it was that happened um, to move them out? Um, I, I don't know if they have moved out yet, but there are always people who pop up and say, shouldn't we have dinner with a black church and invite them to come here? And I find myself cringing. It's not, they are not inviting real um, respectful contact. They're, they're doing something that comes from I think being in this stage. Can you say a little bit more about that, Joan? Well, there periodically there's the urge to do something with social justice and contact with with them, with those black people. And what always gets suggested is eating together, having dinner together, as if that would take care of a relationship. And the eating together becomes the substitute for developing under, full understanding that's respectful and really the effort that goes into self-examination before you start um, something else. They're, they jump over the work of anti-racism in a way and so do the what, ritual thing instead. So what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is people are trying to connect and I'm, I'm hearing a little bit maybe in a, a superficial way without actually having done their own formation, without That's right. having done their own self-education. So that's something I'm going to make a note of that. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's not, that's something actually I see a whole lot and then I forget that I see it a whole lot. So <laughs> let's, um, let's, when we do the recap, we'll talk about self-education a little bit. So anybody else? Yeah, it, it is Mary. And uh, in our, in our, we spent a lot of time on white privilege um, this year. We did a, um, a lay service on it. We showed the White Like Me movie. We did a book discussion around it. Um, and, and, when it came, and then we had a lot of small group meetings after services in the, um, just to allow people to um, be in conversation about what they were thinking and how they were. And the one that, that really strikes me was um, a couple one day who said, okay, I really understand why we want to focus on black lives because it's very bad for them. But it was bad for the Irish when they came and my family had it bad too. And there's this need to be recognized for the, their own pain before they could move on to understanding somebody else's. And so what got them out of it was just talking through, you know, how, you know, as much as we like to say it's, you know, a welcoming country, it's really not. And welcome is an intentional activity that we all need to you know, to be engaged in and, and not let our past history be the thing that dominates how we interact with others in, uh, in, the, in our current world. So I have a quick question about that. Would you say, because my, my kind of immediate, um, like re analytical reaction to that is when, when, and I, we get this a lot about, I get this, uh, I get this every day where, yes, but um, my ancestors had it hard too. And my pain matters. You know, my pain matters, which is what we often call centering whiteness or centering ourselves mm -hmm. in the conversation. And for me, that is not mm -hmm. necessarily in this analysis, um, but in other analyses, and we did put up on the Facebook um, page, we put up some extra resources that 
some of them expand on 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 Beverly Tatum's work, and some of them are kind of kind of peripheral to that. But that is something that I actually immediately jump to thinking shows up as white resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a resistance to to having that paradigm shift or that heart change or however we term that um, and therefore center the conversation on ourselves. And I'm kind of starting to think that that might lead us into phase two, but I would love to hear a little bit more if anybody has any thing to say about this because I'm feeling like I'm feeling people might be having something to say well if nobody will jump in what it brought up for me that um, well we you know we were like that too the Irish that um, that thinking um, Again, here in Texas and Texas history, um, we just had a runoff election today, and thankfully, the person who is just not even at stage one contact um, got defeated. So um, we can be hopeful that our history books will tell a little bit better story coming forward and um you know one of the things that that i'm thinking about that um is the the books that showed black people coming to this country as a wave of immigration and to me that just so shows the difference of people who come choosing to come and and those who didn't um and you know saying that to people can you have to do it delicately <laughs> but um using that textbook as an example i think is a way that i've had people to understand oh the difference in choice and no choice right yeah. uh, Michael. Yeah. If I could jump in. Please. Um, I have three different um, experiences. Um, one is that uh, people at first wanted to, know, wanted to know why it wasn't all lives matter. And I had, um, rather than, you know, tell them they're wrong, it isn't that it's like, you know, sort of, they were open to talking it through and, and quickly moved to an understanding of why it really that saying Black Lives Matter was not didn't didn't imply that other lives didn't, and that and they understood the rationale of using Black Lives Matter and, and quickly gave up the idea that we need to say all lives matter. So I think there was a lesson there in sort of knowing that would might be people's first reaction, but that they could move past that. Um, the other thing is um, seeing some fear about. Someone harking back to what happened in the church in, was it Tennessee or Kentucky? I don't remember, where someone came in to a UU church. It's Tennessee. And uh, it was in Tennessee. Ten and uh, was it Knoxville? Yeah. Anyway, open fire. And they just, you know, it, it made them nervous, um, calling attention to ourselves, you know, putting up a banner might invite mm -hmm. a response. Um, but they were really, they were kind of uncomfortable with the implications of that, um, of, of, of them of them having that attitude. But recognize that they had that fear. Um, and one of the things is just to make sure that we need to prepare for that, and that people understand. I think I think there can be a larger conversation around that, um, with you know that you're being slightly at risk. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Um, so, but I think we haven't had that conversation, but we are aware that we are going to try and have that conversation in our congregation. And then the third thing that I've seen in terms of resistance um, is people, you know, just being really uncomfortable with the, uh, the, the, the positions of Black Lives Matter, you know, the activist position of demonstrating, of um, 
seemingly it makes him very uncomfortable. You know, why why do we have to? Why can't we just you know figure this all out together? Um, why does it have to be contentious? Why does it have to be so confrontational? And wanting to give advice. You know, do they really want to do that? Don't they realize it's harming their own cause? You know, basically white people wanting to tell black people how they should pursue their own um, equality and fairness and justice in the world. And that, that as a white person, they don't even see, they even see themselves as a white person, just as a thoughtful person themselves, don't they realize that, you know, these black people shouldn't be doing that and it's hurting their own cause. So. So I think, Michael, you would laugh your head off if you saw me wildly shaking my head right now. Uh, <laughs> hey, Carolina. I, I just wanted to, to give a shout out. Michael is a longtime supporter and member of ARE, and we go back a ways. So, um, yeah, I love that you brought this up, and I'm, I'd like to kind of keep that for a little bit later um, especially the second thing you talked about, um, about there being essentially larger political blowback for when mm -hmm. we step out into controversial things, because I think that is, there's a lot of legitimate fear around that, and we should probably mm -hmm. be able to discern what is the difference between that, that resistance, right? Because that still is white resistance, right? right. But but we also need to understand what is kind of a fear that like the generalized fear where we can't even really articulate why we're uncomfortable and maybe to tease out what's difference. What's the difference between discomfort and actual, you know, recognizable risk. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Tennessee Valley. Thank you so much because that is something that moving into more controversial, uh, and there's a story behind that, and I don't know if we'll have time for that tonight, but um, if you are not aware of that, that was actually, it ended up being the impetus for the Standing on the Side of the World campaign, and there's a lot of great information out there. So, um, so is everybody okay if we move into kind of the second piece of it? Um, kind of may, may, I just, may I just ask, throw in a question, please? Sure, Joan, go ahead. Um, I was brought up as a Jew, and anyone who's been around Jews is probably aware that there's an active debate about whether Jewishness is, race, is racial or ethnic. And so I end up being torn about whether to identify the discrimination that I'm old enough to have been subjected to as racial injustice or ethnic um, stuff. And it enters into this, um, how I view and how others may view the whole idea of, of um, Blacks and race, and the a quality that you didn't ask for, but you sure have it, and you take the consequences because society just doesn't necessarily approve, and that that doesn't get recognized. And I don't know if that's seen as resistance or a contribution and understanding. So, um, Joan, are you, are you done? Um, because I don't want to interrupt the question. Yeah. I have, I have quite some opinions already. So one of the things that I, I do actually see those kinds of issues or questions as a resistance thing, because we are looking to parse language or put things into certain boxes that maybe have an excuse. Um, but I want to say for the group that it is the, the, the understanding of allies for racial equity and many other people in anti-racism work that race itself is a social construct that mm -hmm. was made to, um, to 
support and keep in place the idea of white supremacy and whoever is white changes all the time. I think we all know there was a time when the Irish weren't quite white yet, but then they got white. Um, and there are people all the time who are becoming white or unbecoming white. Um, so um, when we view when we view race as a social construct, we have to conclude <clears throat> that any discrimination comes in the form of othering because of generally appearance or because of cultural norms. So it, I understand that Jews sometimes were in the past and sometimes still are now designated as a different race, um, but that is a social construct. It is certainly yep. a different ethnicity. It is certainly a different culture. I have many, many Jewish friends who they, their cultural values are slightly different than mine. And that is a really, really neat thing. And for some people that might be uncomfortable. And then of course we also, because this country is also founded on Christian supremacy, um, we also kind of come up against the religious issue about, well, that's, they don't believe in Jesus and whatever else. I think what it comes down to is that, um, that if you are in this category, you have maybe in the past been more of a marginalized identity than you maybe are now. But in the end, the thing that, the thing that gives rise to your marginalization and maybe more in the past than now is essentially the culture of white supremacy. Um, and that is, that is what decides who is to be othered, right? And it doesn't really matter why you're being othered. We can say it's race. We can say it's religion. We can say it's any number of things, but we are othering in order to ensure our own superiority. So when people come to this question about, oh, is it a cultural difference or, oh, is it race? It's it, the, uh, the root of it is actually supremacy culture, which comes in many forms, including hetero, hetero supremacy and straight suprem supremacy and cis supremacy and white supremacy and Christian supremacy in this particular, in the United States context. I've talked a whole lot, but does that make sense to you, or do we want to tease that out a little bit more? No, that, that makes sense to me. I'd like okay. to make a point. Tanahashi Coates said it for me, that racism is the father of race. We would not worry about races if it weren't races. If we didn't have racism permeating everything from the time the uh, first white settlers came here, they brought the racism with them. And they dominated the Indian nation and later on the black nations. Right, which is actually rooted in the, in the doctrine of discovery, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you have, have heard about that in, within your racial justice work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just being mindful of time um, and I'd like to, maybe we can, maybe we can move through two of these at a time because it sounds like we have quite awesome. I'm so thrilled that everybody is talking. It's so exciting for me. So the next stage is disintegration, which um, I think we touched on a little bit what that might look like in some of our congregations. It says increased interaction with people of color or new information about racism may lead to a new understanding, which marks the beginning of this stage. In this stage, the bliss of ignorance or lack of awareness is replaced by the discomfort of guilt, shame, and sometimes anger at the recognition of one's own advantage of being white and the acknowledgement of, of the role that whites have in maintaining a racist system. Attempts to reduce that discomfort may include denial or attempts to change significant others' attitudes toward people of color. Societal pressures to accept the status quo may lead 
to the, may lead the individual from, dis, um, from disintegration to reintegration, which is the second stage. And reintegration would be, at this point, the desire to be accepted by one's own racial group in which the overt or covert belief, belief in white superiority is so prevalent may lead to the reshaping of the person's belief system to be more congruent with an acceptable racism. The guilt and anxiety may be re redirected in the form of fear and anger directed toward people of color who are now blamed as the source of discomfort. It is easy for whites to become stuck at this stage of development, particularly if avoidance of people of color is possible. So um, the way I kind of read those two together is when we kind of are struck and our worldview is somewhat shifted, we kind of disintegrate a little bit and are rocked a little bit and maybe go through what I think Tema Okun calls in the white ladder, the guilt, shame and blames phase, um, where we either, and I, let me tell you, I, I tend to revisit this phase from time to time, um, where we either feel really guilty about being white and about often about having been kind of so oblivious to our own privilege, or we get really, really angry with white folks and we actually almost disassociate with them. Um, and then sometimes the pressure to, to kind of be comfortable, um, which is again rooted in white supremacy, is our kind of like a customary right to comfort. All of that um, brings us back into, and I think we talked about this before, um, Michael brought it up where we're saying, um, we're saying, oh, why don't, or maybe it wasn't Michael, I apologize. Um, why don't, why don't they do it this way? Don't they realize they're hurting their own movement and all of that? We can probably look at that as a little bit of a reintegration where we're withdrawing again into our white comfort zone and saying, oh, no, 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 they're doing it all wrong. It's too controversial. They should be polite and listen and things like that. So I'd be curious to know, A, first of all, what Donna might want to bring to this particular piece. And the one thing I said in the last webinar, and I will say it again, the disintegration phase, that kind of wanting to get our significant others and the people we're close to kind of on board is the place I go when I'm particularly stressed out and I have been confronted with too much whiteness and too much privilege in a, in a thing, I kind of like move back into this phase. And then I just like want everybody to be anti-racist um, and it's been interesting to me to see how I jump around in this developmental model as different things happen to me. With that, I'll turn it over to Donna, and then we'll hear from others, I hope. Yeah, I appreciate um, the thinking about the... I, I was not coming up with where do I see reintegration, but it has definitely come in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and I was especially thinking about um, you know how we tend to talk about the riots and uh, um, when there really aren't riots you know the, there's there's that to want to make it be like it was uh, before so that for me is where I can can bring that back and and I think it's some like what Laurie was saying some more white splaining you know if we could just all be nice and and you know get along and and I think that people don't want to recognize that um, you know for the most part Black Lives Matter has been resistance it, you know, it's been very specific in, in the way um, that they've been strong, but, but not, um, not in the way of being um, violent. And, and I think people tend to, white people will tend to hear um, Black people who are strong in their opinions and maybe loud in how they speak to put all of 
what they thought before back into play. So that's all I have for that. Right. Anybody have any thoughts about the kind of disintegration, reintegration kind of movement, um, which I, I feel like we're seeing a lot of? Um, if anybody has, uh, has kind of witnessed to that or is struggling with that um, with friends? Well, um, I'll, this is Michael. I'll jump in again and talk about the, the, the I like, the, you know, someone who's engaged in white flaming. Um, I like that term. Um, one of the things that they pointed to was some very powerful African American women. Um, you know, there's Loretta Lynch, who is the U.S. Attorney General, and then we have in L.A. County um, the the District Attorney is an African American woman, and they're both very powerful individuals. And they kind of it's like we should be supporting them and not Black Lives Matter. Because again, so, so one of the things that complicates it is they're simply opposed to, it's not just that they're opposed to Black Lives Matter, it's that they, they offer other alternatives and that, that they point to within the black community. And with the idea that, you know, that they're mutually exclusive, that you know, either, you're gonna either pick one path or the other, I think is one of the fallacies in that, that you, don't, you can do both. Uh, but so, and I think the we're also in in conversation in relationship with the Black Lives Matter group within our community. And one of the things they also see is that many um, African American leaders um, who are leaders in the past are also struggling with Black Lives Matter. Uh, and, and they're running into those kinds of things where the, the, um, the, some of the elders in the African American community are, being, are resistant. Um, and so I think there's gonna be white folks are going to seize on that and bring that up. Thank you, Michael. I, it's something that struck me while you were talking is I, I feel that, and I hear a, a lot of that sort of conversation where people point to individuals, you know, like pe people who say, oh no, we don't have any racism in this country. We have a black president, right? Um, where what how that again for me feels like white resistance you know you're 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 trying to push away a conversation and um what it strikes me is is that often we try and go to individual um we get to individual um circumstances uh, or situations where we're like oh look this person has a lot of power um that that therefore that do, it doesn't they they kind of avoid the systemic analysis, um, and I think that having a systemic analysis um, makes us view um, people of color who are in power very very differently, and we recognize that even if they have this momentary power, the system would not support them in the kind of oppression that the system often supports white folks in committing. So I think what, what kind of instantly comes to mind is that in order to pull, to, in order to kind of help move people from this individual analysis, which almost in, like keeps denial in place, we somehow have to bring in a systemic analysis, however that can be done. And sometimes that has to be done in, you know, a five minute conversation. Um, and all we can do is kind of plant a seed about mass incarceration and all of that. Um, or, or maybe in the way we're approaching it in our communities, in our congregations, et cetera, in our denomination, that is the, um, like the new Jim Crow and all of that really, really brings out a systemic analysis, right? So maybe those are things we should be pushing more to kind of move people from this individual or individualistic mindset to seeing the larger picture. I, I have something to say about these two um, stages and it's, it's kind of from our, more of a personal um, 
it, uh, just per, at the personal level, right? So it, it strikes me that some of our core work as white folks is to get past or out of the cycle, right? And to not, not to play the gotcha game for other white folks that are kind of in the cycle uh, so that, because we, we can so easily shame one another, especially in these early stages of, of identity development and work, right? Doing the work, doing the work clumsily. Um, so <laughs> your heart is in the right place, but you, you know, your, your mouth hasn't quite caught up to where, <laughs> where your brain wants it to be and where your heart needs it to be. So um, I think that a lot of times what, what can happen, and I've certainly seen it in myself, is like I have this intention that I want to go out and do this good work, and then in the process of doing it, I blunder and I mess up. And it gets really uncomfortable when I realize that or when someone calls me out about it. And so it's really easy to kind of retreat and go back into that reintegration phase and be like, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, being in intersectional space is not an easy thing to be in, right? Doing the work with, uh, 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 of racial justice is not always easy to do. And people may not say the right things or, or adopt the right attitudes or, or, or even just bring the right attitudes or spirit to it. And so I think that um, to build the movement beyond just a, a little bit, you know, just a little foray into that space, we need to develop past the reintegration phase. So just um, doing so with that, minimizing the shaming tactics, I guess, <laughs> intentional or otherwise. Yeah, and, and I think that I, I hear... Hmm. It's interesting because I hear often a lot of lip service about, oh, we should get used to making mistakes and we have to forgive ourselves and we're not perfect and all of those things. But then we, we don't exactly do that, right? Like we, we say it. Um, but I love that you brought that up because it makes me really wonder if we, if we create for ourselves spaces I call them debrief spaces right where we like sit around and say well okay so yeah that didn't go too well or whatever where we can be held in our failing right in our mistakes in our blundering in our stumbling and also forgiven and be given a space to forgive ourselves maybe it would be easier for us not to retreat into that reintegration. Um, if, if we were kind of like held like in front of the doorway of reintegration and say, no, we're going to hold you here and we're going to talk about those mistakes and we're going to recognize that that is a part of building a movement, right? And we need to talk about it and it needs to be okay. In the end, I think, we want to be mindful, sure, but part of me thinks, you know, the more mistakes we make, like, like we could learn really faster, you know. So, um, so anybody else have have kind of some commentary about that? Yeah, I think that I think the tricky thing is being able to be mindful and acknowledge what we have done without it being a matter of shame, because shame is counterproductive. When people are ashamed, um, they act in ways that, that aren't forward moving. So I think there's a delicate balance that, that needs to be achieved in order to move ahead and to get to the next stage. Well, I, I this is Michael. I want to make a comment. I want to, I'm not sure. Okay. With shaming, I think we need to model. I think I, what I need to do is I need to model myself how I work through a mistake without mm -hmm. shaming myself. Yeah. You know, it, it's not about, it's not about just me not shaming somebody else. It's also, I think, it's about not shaming myself in front of other people. 
and, and showing them positive ways in which I, I recognize that I made a mistake and I work through it and I don't beat up on myself that I just like sort of accept, okay, I made a mistake. Here's what I, here's how I may maybe make amends. And this is how I'm going to move forward in a way that so that I'm modeling that for other people. Yeah, and that's got to include how you use the acknowledgement of your error. I want to go back to where Carolina was talking about being in the places, how important it is to debrief, and I see Leslie move up here. To me, you know, that is so important, the intent versus the impact. And sometimes it really helps to have other people help you understand the impact and to work on together how you might bring whatever you were trying to bring in a way that isn't harmful or hurtful. And um, so I just want to lift that up and Leslie see you coming up there figuring you must have something to say. So. So I, I go, go Leslie and then, uh, but yeah. I do want to stay here because this is a really, really cool place. I think. I, I was thinking about the, it sounded like maybe Carolina, you might be saying that if we can um, prevent getting into some of these stages, I, I'm not sure if that's where you were going. Like, how do we keep people from getting into a certain stage or how do we get them out of a certain stage? Um, and it reminded me of the stages of grief, how you like have to go again and again and again and around and around. And I'm wondering if it, if it's, it's more like how do we hold each other when we're in these places um, without going to that white superiority you know I'm in a I'm in another stage than you are for today <laughs> tomorrow you can pick me back up great point yeah that's great and no I I actually I'm a huge huge process person Leslie I am huge on process um, I just I recognize that reintegration tends to be a little bit less about kind of the steps than it does often be about regression, right? Like this is where we retreat to. So, and I'm not saying we shouldn't let that happen. I mean, if that's where people are, that's where people are. And we have to figure out also how to hold them in that space, you know, but I think if we create certain conditions that doesn't require for people to re regress or retreat or, you know, so that's where I was going. But what I think is um, really interesting, I hope I didn't lose my point now, um, is that, oh, it was about shame um, and accountability. And I think that one of the things I think we all know about, about the culture of white supremacy is that it, defensiveness is a component of that, right? And a lot of people, I think defensiveness is where that whole, whole that, that not all white people and like, um, kind of almost the all lives matter thing. Like when we're saying black lives matter and then people say, well, all lives matter. They're, they're defending something that we haven't, we haven't said that other lives don't matter, but we're already in this kind of defensive place. And that defensiveness, I think gets us to confuse um, shame, you know, with um, being accountable, right? Being held to account. Um, and, and that kind of threatens our comfort level. And I just wanted to say, you know, Michael, I, I loved what you said about, you know, I have, to, <clears throat> I have to deal with it in myself, right? I have to deal with how, when I make a mistake, um, how do I make it that, um, that I can be accountable and that I don't confuse that with shame? Right, because those are two really, really different things. So that's just what I wanted to kind of notice about that. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not about, I do not believe in surgical extraction in this particular case, and I do not believe in skipping steps in this particular case. Um, but I believe that we can really, really regress when we are in, honestly, spiritually unsafe territory. And this work, we just want to mention this, is this work is spiritually unsafe territory, whether that is 
um, that it threatens some of our longstanding relationships, whether or not that is we are at political risk when we do controversial work. Um, so, um, or whether or not that's we are just kind of getting out of our own comfort zone. Um, this is, you know, shaky work. So, um, anybody want to say anything before we kind of blow through? I just want to be mindful of time. We have about 20 minutes or so, not quite, um, before we wrap up, and we only halfway through. Um, but anybody have any other thoughts before we move on to pseudo independence? Just a real quick thought. Um, I've done a lot of work with low ropes course initiatives. I don't know if any of the rest of you have, opposite of high ropes um, being more individualistic, but low ropes being more group processing, following that. And I just see a lot of possibilities with that, um, especially, like I say, feeling left out and then moving toward a spiritually safe place. And I just want to throw that in. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I appreciate, Carolina, you bringing this up and others, the person who said we're all ministers, I think there might be four of us here, to keep grounding ourselves and that these are spiritual practices and they're muscles and we have to keep working and practicing to, um, to not cast harm on ourselves um, so much. So that's really all I want. Carolina, you want me to go on to pseudo independent? Yeah, if you want to read a little bit, I would love that. Okay. Information seeking about people of color often marks the onset of this stage. The individual is abandoning beliefs in white superiority, but may still behave in ways that unintentionally perpetuate the system looking to those targeted by racism to help him or her understand. The white person often tries to disavow his or her own whiteness through active affiliation with persons of color. The individual experiences a sense of alienation from other whites who have not yet begun to examine their own racism, yet may also experience rejection from persons of color who are suspicious of his or her motives. Persons of color moving from the encounter to immersion phase of their own racial identity development may be particularly unreceptive to a white person's attempts to connect with them. And I'm just gonna start us off here saying that's really how Allies for Racial Equity came into being because of um, the people who kept wanting, um, the white people who kept wanting people of color to explain and excuse. So, um, you know, and those, when you look at that, this is number four and six stages. If you think about them going linear, you know, these are people, what was it? 11, 12 years ago um, that this that Allies for Racial Equity came into being. Um, so people who thought they were really doing the work um, were, were still at this stage. And I, I got to say, just like Carolina was talking about going back into disintegration, I can go there and I can certainly go into this phase of asking and um, I have one really good friend, person of color that we have an agreement that I can ask her things um, that I wouldn't ask someone that I didn't know really well. Um, and ooh, sometimes the thing she tells me, I don't want to hear, I, I don't want to hear. So I, um, just the one thing I have to say about this, I, I wish so much that I had read this particular resource years and years ago because I was in the pseudo independent stage for a really, really, really long time. Um, and it can sometimes be a really frustrating kind of disempowering place to be in where you think 
you know, you're thinking you're so in the work, you know, I'm so in the work. And, um, and then some people are so not validating that for you because maybe you're still showing up in kind of some very oppressive ways. Um, I find a lot of people in movement spaces, not necessarily in UU spaces, but in movement spaces tend to be here. This I think is broadly applicable, not just around racism, but really any kind of oppression where there are people who are in the movement. And I, I do a lot of work with the LGBT community and there's you know, so much um, still oppression from the LGB people against the T people but everybody thinks they're in the movement, right? But still there's kind of a lot of a lot of frustration there. Um, so it's just an interesting phase to be. And I would just love you're to- Jack or anything when you get to pull your team? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? I thought I was on mute, Carolina. <laughs> sorry. That's okay, no worries, no worries, Michael. So, um, so I would love to hear, um, and again, we got to be really careful. I think we have five minutes to get through the last two phases, but if anybody has, if anybody feels like maybe they're here in this place themselves, um, um, I would love to hear from you, and I would love to hear how you might be challenging yourself. I find myself here, this is Mary, um, uh, often in my impatience with people who won't think about it. And, and, I, and, I, and I recognize that impatience that I have and the struggle to meet people where they are as opposed to where I want them to be and where I feel like I need them to be. And, uh, and, and that's something I work on all the time. So do you have any specific strategies that you do or is there like any mantra you say in your head or? Um, I sometimes say everybody's on their own path. Right, and, uh, and so that one helps me, you know, that one helps me sometimes. Um, I use, um, in my community, I use Martin Luther King's, um, the, some of the um, quotes from his letter from a Birmingham jail about white moderates and their love for order more than justice and shallow understanding is from people of goodwill is, um, I forget exactly, but is, is more, more difficult than outright ill will. And so um, we use that, and I use that to sort of help people see past what some of their, some of their stuck spots might be in, this, in these places. But it's right. my patients that I struggle with the most, I would say. Right, yeah, and that is, I, I am, I, impatience is my big demon too. Like, and it is just like the big bad demon for me. Um, I have to say that I use, um, I use a, a um, as a mantra, um, uh, it's something that I actually have in my email signature. Um, I use from Gandhi, and uh, he, he said at one point in time, uh, rivers of blood m may have to flow before we gain our freedom, but it must be our blood. And I keep bringing myself back to, you know, if I'm engaging in the struggle, then my blood will be shed too, right? And our blood will be shed too, and our blood may look different, then you know blood of white folks may look different than the blood of folks of color but we have we have to shed some blood right like we don't get to not shed blood just because we're we're people of privilege so anyone any any other thoughts Okay, not hearing any, I am gonna move on. And I think we're just gonna do immersion and immersion and autonomy, kind of read. Actually, Donna, if you wanna read that, that'd be great. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll give that maybe six minutes or so, and then we'll do maybe two, three minute wrap up. Okay. Immersion, immersion, uncomfortable with his or her own whiteness, yet unable to truly, to be truly anything else, the individual may begin searching for a new, more comfortable way to be white in this stage. Learning about whites who have been anti-racist allies to people of color is an important part of this process. Whites find it helpful to know that others have experienced similar feelings and have found ways to resist 
the racism in their environments, and they are provided with important models for change. And finally, autonomy, the internalization of a newly defined sense of self as white is the primary task of this stage. The positive feelings associated with this redefinition energize the person's efforts to confront racism and oppression in daily life. Alliances with people of color can be more easily forged in this stage because the person's anti-racist behaviors and attitudes will be more consistently expressed. Yeah, this is great. So I'm just the immersion. I, I read this, the immersion and immersion thing in just a whole new way just now. And that is, isn't, isn't that what we're kind of doing right now? You know, isn't that we are um, still uncomfortable with the whole whiteness thing, but we are not able to be anything else. And we're trying to find ways to do that now. So we have these conversations amongst each other and we look towards other role models. Um, and we, I have to say that sometimes when I'm deeply, deeply frustrated, you know, I find myself exactly here. This is actually probably the most emotional state I get into. Others tend to be just more kind of in the head and frustrated. This is like, I need to be with people who get me and um and who are doing this and who are committed so i feel like it eventually will be okay um and i need to look towards people who have done it historically and and i need to learn from people who are a long time in the work um so i'd be curious to know if anybody has anything to say about that Yeah, well, I'm going to jump. Uh oh, who's there? Um, I was going to say that I, uh, I mentioned this in the last one, but I wanted to just mention it again since we do have new people. Um, this is the, the second to last phase here in the what you just described, the immersion, immersion. Um, for, for me, it has really been helpful to be part of the covenant group with the CLF. Um, that's definitely the place where this happens for me on a consistent basis. Um, and yes, I do agree that part of what we're doing here tonight is, is that kind of work, coming together as white folks doing this work in various, various contexts and various stages, but uh, being able to share our experiences to learn from each other and also just to get that sense of, I'm not alone <laughs> in this work. <laughs> and it totally comes, you know, after or you know sometimes it's in you still fall back into pseudo independence right because like you feel like you're in the rock and the hard place place right where the white folks around you don't get it and you you can't really take it to the people of color because that's not cool either and so um there's a lot there's a lot between those two phases of pseudo independence and immersion immersion so what what i notice is when i have started to form community with other white folks doing the work um, I, it helps me to be better at the work. We, um, CLF just had um, a webinar for ministers talking about ministering against resistance. And um, so there's been conversations on the minister's Facebook pages and one of them, people like how you all started out talking about your Black Lives Matter banners, you know, what you did to get there. Some just bought it and put it up and some went through this long process. Um, and someone whose name has been associated with being a white ally and really getting it for a long time went through the whole process that his church had gone through and it just it helped me so much to see that that here's someone who's who's been doing the work a lot and is known for it and still helped the people along through all the stages to get to the point where 
they not only put up the Black Lives Matter banner, but they made a resolution um, in their congregation um, to support, um, which is to me one step further. This is who we are. This is our identity. And um, our congregations don't do that very often, and we don't do it lightly. So um, that brings us kind of almost to the conclusion. Um, and we're just, I'm just checking with our tech deck if we might have a, a minute or two of grace because we have two minutes to wrap it up. Um, I want to come back to, so we, one of the things we touched on, I think today was self-education that we, we need to do that first of all for ourselves, but also like kind of urge those around us to do it. Um, so we really are coming on a firm foundation before we start moving into racial justice work. Um, we talked a little bit about how centering whiteness really looks, shows up as white resistance. Um, we talked about the importance of systemic analysis to you know, bring people out of the individualistic mindset um, and into a, you know, into a much more larger kind of whole picture. And we talked about the importance of forgiveness and of making mistakes and all of that. And I think sometimes we forget that those tactics right like just simply the tactic of mindfulness or the tactic of forgiveness or the tactic of um, giving both ourselves and others grace to make mistakes those are ways of challenging this culture and those are way of bringing the movement forward and it's it's not always what you can you know the next workshop you do or the next book you read or whatever sometimes it is like the deeper spiritual practices I want to go back just briefly because I, Michael, I had promised to touch on this, and I, I want to touch on it. Um, you had talked a little bit way early on about blowback and that there's fear around that. I think that's a little bit later in our development when we start becoming, uh, you know, mindful of what the systemic, um, what the systemic thing is, um, and then we start realizing what the reality is, what really the reality is that, you know, our Black Lives Matter banners will get um, ripped apart and will get defaced and all of that. And we might have to buy more. We might have to do something about that. Um, when we start becoming um, aware of a new political reality, this is kind of the space I live a lot. Um, I work a lot with people who... We're going to, our tech tech has said we can go over just a few minutes. If that's okay, please hang out. We're going to do a couple more minutes. So, um, so uh, when we have this, we kind of awaken and there's this whole new awareness and it's very exciting. And, and then we are confronted sometimes with white resistance, sometimes from a system, sometimes even within our congregation, maybe, maybe, people who are above us in the food chain a little bit are are kind of not wanting us to go so far so fast um and and then sometimes we get blowback from the larger system when we've we've made ourselves known as activists and then all of a sudden we start having more and more trouble with maybe law enforcement or or other systems um maybe our employer etc that is a real, 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 real thing. Um, and we can be really radicalized. I am one of the people who's considerably radicalized. And I'm like, oh, well, it all go hang. You know, it doesn't matter. But the truth is, it really does matter. And I think if we want to be in a movement long term, we really have to think about calculated risk. And we also have to be willing to take risks and to have our privilege really challenged and dismantled um, we will not have it as easy when we are deep in this work but we also want to make really smart choices um, i just want to say the blowback is real i think some people who have been in this work longer really have come to know that and i listen to their wisdom now um, as radical as i would love to be um, this is real. Um, right now I work with a, with a congregation who does sanctuary and they do a lot of other things around immigration and they recognize that, um, that there are certain risks they cannot take if they want to continue to be giving sanctuary. 
and that is that is a real political reality for them um, and that is the space that I see and I hope that all of us are actually moving into which is a whole new version of white resistance any last thoughts Okay, hearing none, um, I will say, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. This was, this was a great conversation, and it's been really informative to hear where a lot of you are because Allies for Racial Equity is going to start planning their next year and what it is we'll be offering and what it is that we'll be engaged in. So this is, gives us a really good sense of, you know, where we all are and, and how do we move forward. Um, we do have four ARE members who will be attending General Assembly. We have two webinars coming up. Um, I believe they are June 2nd um, and June 7th. And if you can attend those, I'm unclear about the times right now. Um, so, but June 2nd and June 7th, and I'm kind of feeling like it's probably gonna be around this time. Um, and with that, we have two minutes, and I would like to ask our clergy person to, to clergy us out. Hey, Donna, you're muted. Okay. Okay, there we go. So um, I found one of my favorite new books. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this one. Um, and it's a reading from Bill Sinkford, who was just someone I really, truly admire. He says, we are a gentle and generous people, but let us not forget our anger. May it fuel not only our commitment to compassion, but also our commitment to make fundamental changes. Our vision of the beloved community must stand against a vision that would allow the privilege of the few to be accepted as just and even holy. Our religious vision must again and again and again ask, who is my neighbor? And strive always to include more and more of us as we intone the words that gave birth to this nation, we the people, we are and we should be both a gentle and an angry people. Amen. Amen. Bill Sinkford by way of Holly Near. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you every much, every very, very much for everybody for joining us. Yes, uh, and thank we, you. We are happy to continue the conversation a little bit in social media, and we are available. Um, if you're looking to find us in social media, we have the Allies for Racial Equity discussion group. We also have our page. Um, find us there, and we'll talk more. I'm always, always interested in having conversations.